going to start off with a brief introduction to baby brain development. At conception, you have just one cell, a fertilized egg. This divides and differentiates and, as early as two to three weeks, the initial structures of the brain and nervous system start to form. The majority of neurons are created by the time the baby is born, but the brain continues to develop throughout childhood and is largely complete by early adulthood. Although we believed that after a certain age, the brain no longer had the ability to grow or regenerate, we are now aware that there is an element of brain growth in later years. The newborn brain consists of about 100 billion neurons. This is quite difficult to measure in newborns, but we do have data supporting a figure of 86 billion neurons in the adult brain. The three key structures in the human brain are neurons, glial cells, and neural connections. The latter two continue to develop throughout childhood and into adulthood. Prenatal development is heavily influenced by genetic processes. In postnatal development, however, the environment plays a much bigger role in child development. Brain research suggests that brain development is a hierarchical process of wiring the brain, in that higher level processes build on a foundation of lower level processes. For example, Language development depends critically on sensory and perceptual development, such as discrimination of speech sounds. Depriving young children of the kinds of experiences that are essential to later development, that is, the building blocks that create the scaffolding upon which development depends, leads to severe consequences in both brain structure and function. Studies of institutionalised children suggest that quality psychosocial experiences are necessary for the development of a healthy brain. This slide gives you a view of how rapidly the brain grows in the early years period. The brain grows at an amazing rate during development. At times, during brain development, 250,000 neurons are added every minute. At birth, a person's brain will have almost all the neurons that it will ever have. The brain continues to grow for a few years after a person is born, and by the age of two years old, the brain is about 80% of the adult size. You can see the relative weights from the top graph and the table. The weight increases rapidly in the first three years of life and is fairly stable after the end of the early years for the rest of the lifespan. Seeing as most neurons have already been created by birth, you may wonder why the weight of the brain goes up so markedly afterwards. The answer lies with the glial cells and myelination which is important in the strengthening of neural connections. These both continue to form well into childhood. Glial cells carry out many important functions for normal brain function, including insulating nerve cells with myelin. This myelination is another source of increase in weight. We are now going to look at the creation of the brain. Upon conception, the sperm fuses with the egg and a zygote is formed a single cell containing genetic material from the father and the mother. This cell then splits into two, then into four, then eight, and so on until a sphere of cells forms called the blastula. By about two weeks, this sphere starts to organize itself into a three-layered structure consisting of the mesoderm, ectoderm, and endoderm. This is known as the gastrula, and the process is known as gastrulation. And by about day 16, a thickening in the ectoderm leads to the creation of what is known as the neural plate. At about 21 days, this plate folds in on itself in a process called neurulation, with the formation of a neural tube of which the inner cells will go on to become the central nervous system, and the outer cells, called the neural crest, become the peripheral nervous system. Different parts of the tube will become different structures in the brain. The anterior portion of the tube will become the forebrain, which includes the cerebral hemispheres. The cells around the middle will become the midbrain, and the rear portion of the tube will comprise the hindbrain. The remaining cells will give rise to the spinal cord. Now let's consider what happens in the first three years of life. In the first 12 months, the remarkable abilities of newborn babies highlight the extent of prenatal brain development. Newborns can recognize human faces which they prefer over other objects, and can even discriminate between happy and sad expressions. 
at birth, a baby knows their mother's voice and may be able to recognise the sounds of stories that their mother read to them whilst they were in the womb. The brain continues to develop at an amazing rate throughout the first year. The cerebellum triples in size, which appears to be related to the rapid development of motor skills that occurs during this period. As the visual areas of the cortex grow, the infant's initially dim and limited sight develops into full binocular vision. At about three months, an infant's power of recognition improves dramatically. This coincides with significant growth in the hippocampus, the limbic structure related to recognition memory. Language circuits in the frontal and temporal lobes become consolidated in the first year, influenced strongly by the language an infant hears. In the first few months, a baby in an English-speaking home can distinguish between English and the sounds of a foreign language. They lose this ability by the end of their first year. The language they hear at home has wired their brain for English. In year two, the most dramatic changes involve the brain's language areas, which are developing more synapses and becoming more interconnected. These changes correspond to the sudden spike in children's language abilities, sometimes called the vocabulary explosion, that typically occurs during this period. Often, a child's vocabulary will quadruple between their first and second birthday. During the second year, there is a major increase in the rate of myelination, which helps the brain perform more complex tasks. Higher order cognitive abilities like self-awareness are developing. An infant is now more aware of his own emotions and intentions. When he sees his reflection in a mirror, he now fully recognises that as his own. Soon he will begin using his own name, as well as personal pronouns like I and me. In year three, synaptic density in the prefrontal cortex probably reaches its peak during the third year, up to 200% of its adult level. This region also continues to create and strengthen networks with other areas. As a result, complex cognitive abilities are being improved and consolidated. At this stage, for example, children are better able to use the past to interpret present events. They also have more cognitive flexibility and a better understanding of cause and effect. I've mentioned neural circuits, connectivity and synapse formation. This is all part of neural connectivity. In the first few years of life, more than one million new neural connections are formed every second. They follow a two-stage process of proliferation, followed by pruning, and in this prescribed order, where the more complex brain circuits are built upon earlier, simpler circuits. This graph shows how the focus of the creation of neural connections is split across three distinct groups. Sensory pathways, like those for basic vision and hearing, are the first to develop, followed by early language skills and then higher cognitive functions. As you can see, all are very active in the first year and continue on into early adulthood. The pruning of connections leads to strengthening of those that are important to us. Here is another view of which circuits are most active during the first seven years. As we saw earlier, you can see here that the sensory circuits have the focus in the initial couple of years, followed by language. The cognitive and social skills then start to pick up towards the end of this period. Although a lot of the information beforehand has focused on how incredibly important the first few years of life are with regards to brain development, it's important to understand that most brain development, especially regarding the neural connections, is not permanent. Contrary to what we thought previously, we are able to learn for as long as we are alive. However, there is a cost involved. The graph here is showing the relative plasticity of the brain across the lifespan. Plasticity is the brain's ability to reorganize itself by forming new neural connections. The ability to change is very high in the first few years and declines rapidly. In tandem, the effort required to make such changes also increases as we age. And so, throughout life, the brain can adjust to compensate for injuries, adjust to new situations, or to changes in environment. Plasticity continues as long as we have the incentive to learn new things, but it does become harder as we get older. B 
Being born is not easy, and being born early is even more difficult. The whole point of the nine-month gestation is to allow for sufficient development to have occurred for the baby to be able to survive independently. Preterm birth exposes the baby to the outside world when its organs are not yet sufficiently developed to deal with such an environment. This is fairly visible when looking at functions such as breathing and feeding, which need to be done with external assistance. But what about the brain? The premature brain is subjected to sensory inputs that are not typical and unexpected for a baby of such an age, such as strong visual stimulation, loud noises and the effects of gravity. In the womb, the baby is asleep for 90 to 95 percent of the time. During this time, the brain is busy growing and making connections between neurons. Premature birth disrupts the sleeping patterns and therefore this time for brain growth. A Swiss study using MRI scanning to look at the brains of six-year-olds found that the neuronal pathways of preterm children were less efficient, correlating with impaired social and cognitive skills. This is a really important point, because we are continually improving medical techniques, resulting in a higher survival rate of preterm births. In the Western world, 50% of very premature babies, at 24 weeks, will now survive. It seems we do a great job in extending life, but perhaps we haven't thought enough about the longer term effects on development and quality of life. This is important for the early years practitioner. It is vital to be aware of the pregnancy history of the children in your care. There are several factors that can affect brain development and this is most prominent in the womb or the early years. We've already looked at preterm birth and how the lack of sleep and abundance of new stimuli puts extra strain on the brain before it is ready for such input. Nutrition is one of the biggest factors that can affect healthy brain development. One of the most well-known deficiencies is folic acid. Insufficient folic acid can affect the neural tube development. If you remember, this happens at about three weeks and so could easily affect women with unplanned pregnancies, i.e. where they don't yet know that they are pregnant. Due to the seriousness of the condition and the relative ease of resolving it, the government guidelines are for premenopausal women to ensure adequate intake of folic acid. The other key nutrient is one of the omega-3 fats, docosahexaenoic acid, or DHA. Although this can be produced in the body from shorter chain precursors, the best dietary source is oily fish. Certain toxins can have a detrimental effect on the developing brain. One well-known toxin is mercury, and this is why there are recommendations for expectant mothers to avoid certain fish like shark, marlin and swordfish. Drug abuse certainly is bad for the growing fetus, and due to its ready availability and social acceptance, alcohol is of particular concern. There's been an ongoing debate as to whether there is a safe limit of alcohol for expectant mothers. A very recent Australian study looked at women who only drank in moderation, up to two units at a sitting and no more than six units per week. At this level, the study showed that alcohol was still detrimental, with a greater risk of the child developing psychological and behavioural issues later in life. Finally, stress can also be negative to the child's development. When it comes to stress and the effect on the baby or child, we can categorise this into positive stress, short-lived with immediate effects, tolerable stress, a bit more serious but still manageable, and toxic stress, sometimes referred to as chronic stress. Stressful or traumatic experiences such as abuse and neglect can affect the brain's architecture in negative ways. This can lead to stress-related disorders including mental health problems, drug abuse and even diabetes and cardiovascular disease.